everyone. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are now beginning with the brown matter. And council, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My apologies to myself and the commissioners and those persons waiting. There are some administrative matters that took a little longer than I thought they would have taken. Thank you, council. I'd like to call the witness for today, Mr. Charles. We'll have him sworn, please. Brown. Thank you, mm -hmm. Madam. May I say to the witnesses, when you're speaking, kindly remove your mask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Madam Chair, there's also Mr. George Brown. I believe at some point he may need to interject okay. with answers. So, so should we have him sworn at, at the same time? Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Yes. So we'll uh, Mr. Charles Brown first and Mr. George Brown. So at least they're both sworn. Charles Brown, swear by Almighty God, swear by Almighty God that, the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, shall be the, truth, the, whole truth the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Yes. I, George Brown, I, George Brown, swear by Almighty God, swear by Almighty God, that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and your Commissioners. Might I just indicate that, in anticipation of what Mr. Charles Brown will say. I think I may need to ask, uh, ask you to consider some adverse notices being issued. It mm -hmm. appears that I may have to intersperse it throughout, but I would just forewarn you mm -hmm. that I may ask for them okay. and ask that the respective parties are given an opportunity to be here. But I will continue as best as I can around the other bit of evidence that okay. I just indicate beforehand. So are you going to be asking me at the relevant time? I am, Madam Chair. Okay, very well. Uh, just for, by way of clarification, when an adverse notice is asked for, uh, the, the commission will grant it if in fact it's going to be, the witnesses are speaking to something that may give reputational damage. And so um, the person has a right to be heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I will issue an adverse notice. And when I say I, it's a collective I because I speak for all of us. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Council? Thank you very much, Madam. Y your name is Charles Brown, sir? Yes. Okay. And you reside in Bermuda, sir? I do, yes. Where do you reside? Uh, Wing Cottage, 9, Tribe Road, number 3. Southampton. Okay. No, sir. On the 12th of March, 2020, you submitted a claim to the Commission of Inquiry into Historic Losses of Land in Bermuda. That is correct. And you submitted that claim in your own right, or is it, was it in relation to other persons? It was on behalf of the beneficiaries of the late John Augustus Alexander Virgil. And I'm just going to ask you to speak a little slow and repeat the surname for me. Certainly. The submission was on uh, behalf of the beneficiaries 
of the late John Augustus Alexander Virgil. Okay. And Mr. Virgil, who is he to you, sir? He would be my mother's uncle. So he would be my great uncle. Thank you. What is your mother's name? My mother's name is Barbara Lucille Brown. Okay. Now, the claim that was submitted on this date I mentioned, the 12th of March, 2020, were there any other beneficiaries on whose behalf you made this claim? Yes, the, the claim was on behalf of the seven named beneficiaries to Mr. Virgil. I'm just going to ask you to name the beneficiaries for me. Certainly. Um, the um, beneficiary's name is Sylvia Davis, Marion Johnston. How do you spell the Marion? M A R. I O N. Thank you. Glenn Ming. I'm going to ask you to spell the surname for me. M I N G. Thank you. Gladwin Mo Ming. M I N G. Thank you. Marie Diane Spence. Mar is that Marie or Maria? Marie. How do you spell it? M A R. I E and surname Spence. Thank a you. A a Eunice Ming and Barbara Lucille Brown. Those are the seven named beneficiaries. Thank you. On whose behalf uh, I represent. Could you indicate, in relation to each person you just named, the relation to Mr. John Augustus Alexander Virgil. The named beneficiaries would be John Augustus Alexander Virgil's nieces and nephews. Okay. Total of seven persons? Seven persons, yes. And you include yourself, are, are they? No, I, uh, that's, no, that's, this is for my mother's generation, okay. those seven. Thank you. Uh, I don't qualify for that. Thank you very much. Now, in respect of the claim that was submitted by you on this date, the 12th of March, 2020, you have submitted mm -hmm. some opening remarks you wish to make prior to us here in the actual evidence. That's mm -hmm. correct? That is correct. Okay. This document, open remarks, is dated November 25, 2020, and you have signed this document, the copy I have. I just ask before I commence, Madam Chair, that the witness, Mr. Charles Brown, just is allowed to make these open remarks. Indeed, yes, Mr. Brown, you may go do so. Before he does Thank so, you. I'm just going to ask that he be allowed to identify his signature on the document, the original, uh, it be made an exhibit, and then he may be allowed to read the document. Right. Uh, Mrs. Swan, would you be kind enough to uh, present the document to Mr. Brown for signature, please? document is being shown to you, sir. Is that your signature? Yes. Okay, thank you. You have a copy of that document? I do. Okay. Madam Chair, I wish to ask that that document is tender admitted as Exhibit CB1. Yes. I, there are a number of browns here, Council. I'm sorry. I'm wondering if we should not use the middle initials as well. Just, uh, C C N L B 
B bro I'm sorry C N L B one C N L C L for Lloyd. I'm not sure what it stands for, but uh, okay. uh, Sir, could you give me all your initials? C N uh, N for Ned. N for Neville. L for okay. Leroy. C N L Brown. So I'll enter as Exhibit 1 the document from which he makes his opening remarks and it's signed and dated the 25th of uh, October 2020. Thank you very much. Please go ahead, sir. Opening remarks submitted on behalf of the named beneficiaries to the Commission of Inquiry into historic losses of land in Bermuda. Regarding last will and testament, John Augustus Alexander Virgil, deceased January 17, 1972. Regarding approximately four acres of real estate at Spring Benny, Spring Benny Road, Spring Benny Drive, and Spring Benny Lane, Sands Parish, Bermuda. Good morning. My name is Charles N. Al Brown. I am the fourth child of a named beneficiary, John Augustus Alexander Virgil. Today, I am representing my ancestors and speaking on behalf of those who sacrificed and participated in this struggle. I am joined today by my mother, Barbara Brown, my brother, George Brown, and some family members present today. It is the position of the name beneficiaries of the last will and testament of John Augustus Alexander Virgil. You may refer to as Augustus Virgil, or we refer to as Uncle John. Uh, there is evidence, there's extensive and conclusive evidence that exposes the outcome of a conspiracy to hatch and execute a clumsy plan to deceive, misrepresent, steal property and profit. This plan with official misconduct, greed and deceit at its core used a network of formal and informal business relationships, ignorance, arrogance, and a callous disregard for law and order in order to carry out a set of fraudulent activities. Based on our evidence, it is clear that the objective of the plan was to complete an illegal land grab. This would see the production, vouching for, and use of fake documents and transactions with established corporate entities in Bermuda. For decades, along with muscle, money, and power, the architects of this conspiracy and their associates have managed to avoid being held to account. The evidence points to the look and feel of corruption in high and low places. This appears to be a plan that was carried out with the sanction and blessing of banking officials, lawyers, real estate agents, who were all ably aided and abetted by a cast of characters eager to exploit those least able to defend against economic bullying. That this matter is only now formally being presented to an adjudicating body is perhaps more a function of who is involved and not what was perpetrated, its gravity or its consequences. The injustice we speak of today spans generations. And I, as the messenger, I carry a message on behalf of many before me. Addressing the commission today is a significant milestone. Our message is from our ancestors of 1885. And this is a step towards some measure of closure after tireless efforts <laughs> in pursuit of justice after almost 50 years. 
Despite extraordinary efforts to be heard in a court of law in this country, the beneficiaries have been systematically denied the opportunity to present a case for their rightful claim to what was willed to them. Despite the seemingly coordinated efforts to deny due process, faith in the strength of the evidence which exposes the improper behavior, that faith was unwavering. Notwithstanding the cold and insensitive decision of Bermuda's 2014 governor, we are now here. The named beneficiaries lay legal claim to the subject land, and they have been in possession of critical documents and supporting evidence since the passing of their dearly beloved Uncle John. Namely, they've held his will and the title deeds from 1885. The Activities to support the superb sale and transfer of land in question did not comply with the laws of the land. They were orchestrated by dishonest individuals collectively representing what we call a triangle of trickery, including law firms, banks, and real estate agencies that conspired to obstruct the law and deny constitutional due press due process to the named beneficiaries. The expectation is that this commission, in furtherance of its mandate, does cause the matter to be placed before the eyes and ears of justice for its right and proper hearing, leading to some form of redress for the long-suffering beneficiaries, and also to the extent that we can hold the perpetrators of this conspiracy to account under the laws and customs that govern and guide the beautiful islands of Bermuda. It was always our hope that my brother Walden would be here to present our case, but his untimely passing prevents that, sadly. His words resonate through our story and they guide our steps. Many thanks to the government of Bermuda for establishing this commission and a special thank you to the commission members for serving in this manner. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, after providing the Commission of Inquiry with your letter dated March 12, 2020, with a submission of the claim on behalf of your beneficiaries, you supplied evidence or documents in support of what you have described your will say submissions, correct? Correct. In fact, you provided what I will call at this stage two sets of documents, two sets of documentation. One set is numbered 1 through to 18, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. And the other set, which was submitted on June 1, 2020, consists of documents which you have labeled exhibits A, through to N. Is that correct? That's correct. Before we go any further, Madam Chair, I'm just going to ask, before I go to the actual evidence and continue with the witness, I wish to apply to have 
I like to show the witness first and then apply to have tender admitted the schedules that he places reliance on before we actually look at the actual documents in which the supporting evidence is contained. Now, what do you have there, sir? This. Yes, please go ahead. Are you asking me? No, I'm asking what do you have there now? Okay. This is a, a schedule of the evidence that was submitted to the commission. And uh, that schedule, have you ever seen it before? I have um, seen it before. Okay. Did you create it? I did. Okay, thank you. I'd ask that the schedule that is referred to, that that could be tender admitted as Exhibit CN. Would you kindly give us the date of that schedule, the date you presented it? I think it's presented on the one of his letters, is it? Yes. Uh, actually, here, I'll tell you, it's... Um, I got the, the date for the second schedule, second June 1st, 2020. the 21st of October, 2020. Uh, for sure, because I gave that to Mr. Council, is that the schedule 1 to 18? It is, Madam Chair. Could I just get the date that it was very well. sent to us? Because the second, I didn't get the date for the first one, but the second one I have is June 1st, 2020. The, and the, which was his exhibit, A to 18. And the first one is his exhibit 1 to 18. I, I just need the no date. In order to keep a proper yeah. record, Do I need to get it, so. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is it's the 21st of October. 21st of, of October. OK. <clears throat> And that's October 2020? Correct. And that's with your exhibit 1 to 18? Correct. A CNLB2, Madam Chair. Thank you. And that's it's, it's so entered, Council. Thank you. Something else is being shown to the witness now. What do you have there, sir? This is a letter addressed uh, June 1st, 2020, addressed to the Commission. How many pages do you have there? It's um, three pages, including the cover. Have you ever seen that document, those pages before? Yes. Sir. Where had you seen them before? I saw these uh, just before my brother sent them to the Commission. And they have... Uh, just speak into the microphone for me. Please. They, they have a description of the... Uh, items of evidence that were submitted to the Commission in June. And the items that you refer to, are they numbered or in any way? They're they referenced letters? by letter, Exhibit A, B, C, etc. A through to what letter? To N. To N. I'd ask that those three pages, which have, which exhibit documents A through to N, that those three pages are tenor admitted as exhibit CNLB3, Madam Chair. Thank you. So entered as exhibit CNLB3. <laughs> Crave indulgence.
No, Mr. Brown. I'm going to show you a document dated November 25, 2020. Mm -hmm. You can kindly indicate whether you recognize the document. What do you have there, sir? This is a copy of the presentation that has been prepared for today. Who prepared that presentation? The beneficiaries of John Augustus Alexander Virgil. And that is a presentation you wish to make? Yes. And that document that has been shown to you, you did you take it here today or someone else? I, I brought it here today, okay. yes. Just for the clarity, how have you described it? A copy, that's what you said. A copy of the presentation. The presentation. Okay. And the presentation is a slide presentation. It is a slide presentation, okay. yes. How many pages does that document comprise of? It's 61 pages. Okay. I'd ask, Madam Chair, that the 61 pages, a copy, a hard copy, of the slide presentation upon which Mr. Brown would like to, would wish to rely that it is tendered and admitted as exhibit CNLB4. It is so entered as CNLB4, the slide presentation. Did you say 61 pages? How many pages is it? 61. Yeah. I did 61? say 61. 61 pages. Okay. No, in res Mr. Brown, in respect of the Exhibit CNLB4, which was just admitted. Yes. You have that PowerPoint presentation there? Yes. I wish to ask Madam Chair that the witness to be allowed to go through this yes. presentation Certainly. with me. So allowed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is it? What you have projected on the screen, Mr. Brown, that is the very first page of the PowerPoint presentation? Yes, that is correct. Okay. You may proceed. Could you just read for us what you have Certainly. there on the first slide? So this is uh, our presentation to the Commission of Inquiry into Historic Losses of Land in Bermuda. Uh, the information we're about to share is the essence of a claim by the beneficiaries of the will of John Augustus Alexander Virgil, who died the 17th of January, 1972, regarding real estate at Spring Benny, Sands, Bermuda, including Spring Benny Road, Spring Benny Drive, and Spring Benny Lane, dated November 25, 2020. So our purpose today, Madam Chair, Commissioners, is to, to tell a story, to tell our land grab story, where we will show various parties that conspired to execute a plan to take possession of property 
people in positions of power, major institutions, we will show where these parties conspired to execute a plan uh, to defraud Mr. Virgil of his property. Uh, there are two major transactions that occurred during the course of the tenure, the time period that we're covering. And both of these transactions, in our estimation, are fraudulent transactions. One took place in 1961-62. A second transaction took place in 1968-69. We also uh, believe that our evidence will show that major players uh, partnered to obstruct justice and due process. There were reports that were crafted, there were meetings that were canceled, there was intimidatory behavior that was visited upon the beneficiaries. And we will, we will illustrate much of that today. But we will present our facts, we will present what we have, and we will share the conclusions as we understand them. And so before we get into the main body of the presentation, we would like for our beloved brother Walton to share his words when he addressed the House of Assembly July 4th, 2014, regarding the need for commission of inquiry. So, it, Madam Chair, it's three minutes. I'd like for my brother Walton to remind us of why we're here and what we should be looking forward to. I said, Mr. Speaker, we have an opportunity today to commence a process that could bring closure and a sense of justice to scores, if not hundreds, of Bermudian families. We have an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to help correct some of the wrongs of the bad old days when justice was a fleeting illusion a fleeting illusion for many, and where the rich, the powerful, and the connected acted with impunity. The theft of land, the disposition, dispossession of property, took place in this country on a wide scale and over a long period of time. The villains in these actions, Mr. Speaker, were oftentimes lawyers, real estate agents, and politicians. Mr. Speaker, one could be forgiven for concluding that claims of property theft and land dispossession were simply urban, urban legends, stories that circulate the island, a part of folklore, if you will, but with no demonstration of any truth behind them. Sort of like the Loch Ness Monster. Urban legend says it exists, but only few of us have really seen the Loch Ness Monster. So the urban legend continues. Such a conclusion, though, will be based on the fact that no such case of any such claim has been successfully brought before the courts. But it is precisely this lack of adjudication before the courts, for most of these claims, that requires explanation. My view, Mr. Speaker, is that the victims' efforts at securing a just outcome have been constrained by the combination of three powerful forces. One, dominant elites. Two, the politically connected and three, the walls of legalism. Members of the elite, Mr. Speaker, were the lawyers, the bankers, and the real estate agents who worked together to deprive unsuspecting landowners of their property through either a series of sham operations, camouflaged as legitimate transactions, or flagrant violations of the law knowing that there are minimal chances of being held to account. The politically connected, Mr. Speaker, refer to individuals with close ties to politicians, but perhaps more importantly, to people who have actually sat, served in this honorable chamber. 
a significant number of land grabs have their fingerprints and their signatures on paperwork marked for posterity. By the rules of legalism, I mean the extent to which the existing legal framework, including the cost of bringing an action, representation in an action, and limitation issues, how these uh, uh, aspects of the current legal framework have actually prevented justice from prevailing. So, Madam Chair, that was the remarks from my, my late brother as he addressed the House of Assembly, setting the stage, if you will, for what's to follow in terms of our further evidence as it relates to bankers, real estate agents, and lawyers. So this story that we are sharing today has three parts. The first part runs from 1885 to 1961. I'm sorry, let me just, uh, just one moment. You had mentioned earlier the name John Augustus Alexander Virgil. What's the relation between is there any relation between John Augustus Alexander Virgil and Mr. Walton Brown? Yes, um, Walton is my brother, and so it would be Walton's great uncle as well. Okay. Yeah. Give me a person. So, so again, um, three parts to this story. Uh, this story touches spans over three centuries. So the first part is 1885 to 1961. The second part, I might add that from 1885 to 1961, there's no dispute. From 1961-62, there was a transaction during that period. There was a second transaction, 1968-1969. We have issues with both of those transactions. And then the third part of our story focuses on our pursuit of justice from 1972 up until today. So the property in question uh, is the, uh, the fourth um, slide that you will have, Commissioners. This property in Spring Banny is highlighted uh, for ease of reference. You see uh, the yellow, uh, we'll call it a rectangle. It's, um, it's got four sides. So uh, This is the land that we speak of, and approximately four acres of this property, um, which is highlighted in, with a slightly shaded area, more to the right-hand side of it. That is the subject of our story, the approximately four acres of the land that was bequeathed to Uncle John. And Miss Barbara Brown, my mother, of 88, she's 88 years old now, and she's here with us today with some pain, heavy heart, but she has relentlessly led this fight for 48 years. So this is the property that we speak of, just an area of view for your information. The next slide identifies the, the players and the acquaintances that were involved in our story, this, this, this scheme. Um, the, the players, we call them acquaintances because we know that they were acquainted with one another. Uh, that they often spend time together um, in, in business um, relationships, etc., uh, spending time in the same buildings, etc. But the, the players in our story are the Bank of N.T. Butterfield and Sun Limited, uh, trustee and executor. Uh, they were the sole executors of my uncle's will. So all that appears there is a... It's a logo. Logo. Yes, that's yeah. a household name, Bermuda's First Bank. It's an established logo. Yes. I'm yeah. just trying to guide us through the document. Sir, yes, sir. go ahead, continue. Yeah. Um, Cox, Helen, and Wilkinson, as they've uh, become to, know, come to be known, they were the lawyers for Mr. Russell, Levi, Perriman. And then there was Appleby, uh, Sperling, and Kemp, Appleby now. They were the lawyers for Uncle John, John Augustus Alexander Virgil. Then we have the family lawyer, Mr. Eric Arthur Jones. Um, we had Mr. David Wilkinson, uh, counsel for Cox Hallett and Wilkinson. He went on to become the Speaker of the House of Assembly. We have Mr. Robert Modia, who was senior counsel for Appleby, Sperlin, and Kemp. 
But if he went on to become puny judge in these islands, uh, Mr. Russell Levi Pearman, uh, member of colonial parliament, he too was a real estate agent. Um, believe, yes, he did make it to the House of Assembly. Mr. Edward E.T. Richards, former premier. Mr. John W. Swan, realtor, former premier. John Alfred Virgil from Somerset, that's important a first cousin to John Augustus Alexander Virgil. Mr. Arnold Francis, another lawyer involved, and Mr. Leslie Earl Ming, an associate of John W. Swan Limited. These are the players and others that worked together, that conspired over the years, as we can see it, to deprive Uncle John of his property and to profit off of his assets going forward. Okay, just, could I just ask you to pause here a minute? Uh, Madam Chair, I just at this point just indicate based on where we are that adverse notices would be issued to all these persons. I'll just go back through the list. Uh, Council, from my own personal knowledge, I know that some of these individuals are deceased. How do we, do we issue the adverse notice to their descendants or... Or well, what? Well, the estate, which is similar, Their estate. Would, okay. would be appropriate. Let me make but a note, in the cir I'll go through the list one by one, but in the circumstances, I just deem it appropriate that we, we do so. At the top left hand corner. Just, just give me a moment, please, Council. Certainly, Madam Chair. I know that. So I'm making the order, Council. Council requests that adverse notice be sent to uh, individuals listed and if deceased, their estate. But for the purpose of the record, I think I should state it openly. And um, I'm going to ask Council to my right and to... Commissioner. To my right and to my left to help me with the names, please. The first one is Eric. Eric Arthur Jones. Next one. David Wilkinson. David Wilkinson. The next one. Robert H. Mutia. I don't think we are quite here in Commissioner. He has his mask on. I'm sorry. Sorry, Council. Not we weren't here in Commissioner. He has his mask on, but for the record, I'm sorry. I'll start from the beginning. Eric Arthur Jones. Eric Arthur Jones, David, David Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Robert H. Motier, Russell L. Pearman, yes. Edward E. T. Richards, John W. Swan. Ms. John W. Swan and Mr. John, John Alf Alfred Virgil. Virgil. John Alfred Virgil. And Arnold Francis. Leslie Earl Ming. And 
that is the extent of the main yes. persons. The yes. institutions. Right. And oh, and and uh, adverse notice to the institutions as well, Council. I I wish them to the three institutions that I listed there, Madam Chair. Right. Uh, go ahead, the institutions. Butterfield. The Bank of Butterfield. Cox, Hallett, Wilkinson Limited, lawyers. Appleby, lawyers. Now, commissioners, I'm going to ask you, I'm going through this list, and if you ask, I'll kindly assist me to state for the record which ones you know are deceased so that we identify it as being sent to the estates. Uh, the first one, Eric Arthur Jones. Deceased. Deceased. So it will go to his estate. Uh, David Wilkinson. David is deceased. 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 Robert Motier, deceased. Deceased. Russell C. Pearman. L. Pearman. L. Pearman. Deceased. Deceased. Edward E. T. Richards. Deceased. John W. Swan. Alive. Alive. John Alfred Virgil. Deceased. Arnold Francis. Deceased. Leslie Earlme. Alive. Alive. Just to ascertain, Madam Chair, the the named players, not individuals, are those companies I trust bear the same name. Quite. Now, I certainly should put it on record that obviously notice have to be served on this individual, individuals. They have to be given X number of days, perhaps at least five days within which to reply. And then thereafter, we have to hear the application. So this obviously is going to delay the entire process. But this, this is not about delay. It's about unearthing the truth. So I suspect that this hearing, the entire commission is going to be shut down for some time. But um, we'll do what we have to do to do what to, to find the truth. Yes? Yes, Madam Chair. What I what I'd ask is that at, at the time that they would appear, whenever that is, after the evidence is given, that the relevant transcripts could be shared with them. Indeed. And but when so we get we to that continue point, to hear the evidence we'll continue so to hear that the at least we have the record which will be shared with them. Yes, yes, the transcript will be shared with them, give them an opportunity at that time to respond. So we'll just continue okay. until then. Very well. Thank you. You may continue, sir. Thank you. So the, the, the next um, slide, having had a look at who the players were, are, uh, is to draw your attention to three pieces of evidence that have already been submitted to the commission. These three reports are critical. They provide significant evidence in support of our claim, and we use them to cross-reference and fact-check other relevant information that we've uncovered. And it also um, gives us the opportunity to connect certain pieces of data over time. And so the first report is a, a Bermuda police report. The beneficiaries were 
moved in such a way that they filed a complaint with the Bermuda Police Force, as they were known at the time, and the police uh, conducted a, an investigation. And the outcome of that investigation in the report form has been presented to the beneficiaries and has been shared with the, with the commissioners. The second uh, report that we will draw on uh, during the course of this presentation is one that was prepared by the Bank of Anti Butterfield and Sun Limited. The sole executors of the wheel, given their responsibility, both fiduciary and legal, we invited them to draft a report to examine and confirm the title of the, the land, and they engaged Appleby to do such work. The beneficiaries also engaged the Bermuda Caribbean Engineering Consultants Limited, which is a chartered land surveying company. They provided a, a comprehensive report on the transactions of the land from 1885 up until today, and a copy of that report has also been provided to the commissioners, and we'll draw reference to that during the course of today. So those are the three reports that the presentation rests heavily on, and uh, we'll draw on them uh, as we go forward. The next slide is uh, one that sort of sets the stage for ownership where the beneficiaries can show that the indenture made on the 13th day of November, nine, sorry, 1880, uh, an indenture between George Young and Samuel David Robinson. Uh, that then uh, resulted in uh, Samuel David Robinson in 1885 selling approximately seven acres of land to John, uh, to Augustus Virgil uh, in 1885. So that is a slide that you may have in front of you now that shows the cover page of the indentures that links the ownership of this property to the Virgil family. Moving on, the first map that um, you have in front of you says Plan 1, and it's heading, it says, Ownership Following Conveyance of dated 18th of June, 1885. It was this date, 1885, 18th of June, when Augustus Virgil became the owner, took possession of, and has the deeds to back it up, of this approximate seven acres of property, Augustus Virgil. And you can see at the time who some of the neighbors were, just to the north, Reverend Robert Horry, uh, uh, further along to the north, uh, Joseph Roberts, and along the, the eastern boundary, we have the estate of Lydia Burroughs, down to the south, we have Anne Perriman Outerbridge, and over on the western boundary, we have John Seymour Burroughs estate. So that's the, um, the neighbors, but the focus here is, as of 1885, Augustus Virgil was the owner of seven acres or more of this property. Over to 1926, which is the next slide, 1926, the ownership changed because Augustus Virgil passed away. His wife, Elizabeth Virgil, she maintained a life interest in the property. And the siblings, the children, all received an equal share. So you can see Elizabeth Virgil uh, in this uh, ownership map, 25th of April, 1926, you can see that Elizabeth Virgil maintained life interest. She did not earn any of the land, but Lansdowne Maury Virgil, Dora Elizabeth Simmons, Diana Mary Virgil, Thalia Ann Virgil, Mabel Maud Virgil, Harriet Agatha Simmons, Ida Melissa Henry, and Elizabeth Maria Carter. Just before you go any further, you are drawing our attention to Elizabeth Virgil. I'm not seeing that name. Elizabeth is Virgil that, oh. is, her name is... Oh, Liz I'm, I'm seeing it now. Are you sure? Okay, okay, yes. So she um, had life interest at the passing of her husband. My apologies. So, Proceed. Certainly. So as of the, uh, the 25th of April, 1926, 
the land was in equal, it was earned in equal shares by the family members. And the family members' names are Virgil, Simmons, Henry, and Carter. There's four names attached to the ownership of the property, 1926. So we move on. 1929, a sibling, Diana Mary Virgil, she passed away. And a result, as a result of her passing, the oldest son, Lenstein Mary Virgil. Sorry, just to slow down a bit. What you're showing us here, you're trying to trace title. Is that, that's what you're doing? Yes, thank you, sir. This oh. is, in fact, a map that shows the title of the land as certain events took place in the family. Okay, and as you indicated earlier, this is your presentation of your understanding of it, but you have simplified it for our benefit, correct? And that is correct. Okay. And, and you, you should also know that there is an indenture that spells this out. Okay. Right. So we this is a to... graphical ver ver uh, version of what's articulated in an indenture, which we will get to later. Yes, we'll get to it. I just okay. wanted for the especially commissioners to understand this is just a your explanation of your understanding. Yes. Okay, please and, continue. But I, I will add that this is the work of the chartered surveyors, these maps. This is not, we, we commissioned the surveyors to conduct this research and they've presented this to us okay. and we're now sharing it with the commission. Okay. Who are the, the commission surveyors that you it, um, contracted? We mentioned it earlier, it's the Bermuda Caribbean Engineering Consultants Limited. And that's one of the exhibits that was submitted earlier. Okay. And it's one of the three critical reports that we will draw upon during the telling of our story. And when you say we, you refer to the beneficiaries? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. You may proceed. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, the 13th of March, 1929, Elizabeth Virgil maintained life interest. Lenstar Mori Virgil acquired the share of his sister, Diana Mary Virgil. So as the oldest child and the only son and the heir, he now had, Lansdowne Mori Virgil now had two eighths of the share and the others shared one eighth each. So there were six individuals with one eighth and one individual with two eighths, making up the eight eighths of the property as of 1929. Moving on. 1945, March the 20th, Alfred Stanley Virgil, you see he was granted a share of the property, outright ownership. This was the time the mortgage was fully paid. Again, Virgil, Simmons, Henry, Carter as the owners of the property. No transactions to date are in dispute. Virgil, Simmons, Henry Carter, occupying the land with some comfort and peace. 1950, we move on to 1950, there was a petition deed where you see Virgil, Simmons, Henry, and Carter sharing in a piece of land to the western side of the property. And they each had a sixth share each, as you can see from this schematic dated 14th of February, 1950. And then John Augustus Alexander Virgil takes his position as the major shareholder in the remaining portions of the land, as you can see from the Plan 5, dated 14th of February, 1950. And again, Virgil Simmons, Henry Carter, those are the names of the families associated with the ownership of this property as of 1950. And there are no disputes with respect to ownership of this property up until this time. So now we move to a very important part of the story. We move to the part of the story where we focus on two what we call fraudulent transactions. We're going to focus on the southern portion in the first instance of the property that was, that is the subject of this story. So moving uh, ahead, there was an indenture, 1961, December the 9th, that's on page 15 in your 
your presentation. This indenture, duly registered in the registrar's office, is also included in the what we call the Summers Report, which is the Bermuda Caribbean um, report. Uh, and thankfully, um, my mom was, was smart enough to retain those surveyors so that they would do this work. But the indenture states in its opening paragraph that it's dated the 9th day of December, 1961, between Virgil, Simmons, Henry, and Carter. And we introduce the Simons family at this time. So this indenture lays out the terms as of December the 9th, 1961, by which this handsome fella, John Augustus Alexander Virgil, took sole possession of a lot four on the property. And we'll show lot four in a moment. As you can see from the wording in the Adantia, it's rooted in 1885, it makes reference to the Book of Deeds, number 33, page one, between Samuel David Robinson and Augustus Virgil. So December the 9th, 1961, this indenture, which goes on to say that Augustus Virgil, his heirs and assigns, shall quietly possess and enjoy the said lot of land and enjoy it without any interruption or claims whatsoever from other parties that signed off on the indenture. And at the end of the indenture, You'll see it was signed by Mr. Eric or E. A. Jones. Um, and um, Mr. Eric Jones was the, the family lawyer. He also witnessed this indenture. He put his tra um, this transaction here is not in dispute. But well, you, you just provided this to us to give context to your presentation. Yes, okay. that this is the indenture that created the legal authority on which John Augustus Alexander Virgil became the sole owner of Lot 4, which okay. we will uh, step okay. into in, in a moment. Um, the panel should also be aware that at this time, Mr. Modia, Mr. Robert Modia from Appleby, the family lawyer, Mr. Eric Arthur Jones, and the first cousin, Mr. John Alfred Virgil, they were forming an agreement, a covenant, on the future of this very piece of property. So we move to the next page. This slide shows the ownership as articulated in the indenture of December the 9th, 1961. This is the lay of the land. This is what was recorded, this is what was understood, and this is what was accepted as the lay of the land, the ownership at the time. The neighbors 